So, wonderful intro. Um, so, my name is Rob Crowley, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today about GraphQL. This is a journey that I've personally been on and Bank West have been on for about 18 months now. So, we moved from quite a traditional sort of like SOAP mixed with REST interfaces to a new consolidated approach with GraphQL. So, Today's going to be mainly about the technology and sort of like selling the idea of what it could do for you. But then also as we go through or sort of in chats later, we can sort of pick out more of the pertinent bits to say, okay, well, what category of problems will it solve for you? So specifically what we're going to do is kind of cover that initial step of like why GraphQL even exists. If you're facing a certain type of problems, where can it help? Where will it add value? We're then going to move on to say, OK, well, how, how can GraphQL not only solve the, the challenges of sort of like, you know, traditional request response type architectures of you ask a question of the server and you get your payload back, but then also to more dynamic interfaces. So, you know, we have chat that's coming pervasive, you know, chatbots. We have a couple of workshops on it today. We got push notifications. The designs and the experiences we wish to craft today require this blend of pull and push data. And we'll see how GraphQL can provide an elegant solution for both of them. And finally, realistic, we only have 15 minutes today. You know, I will not be able to make everyone in this room an expert in that period of time. It could take days. I could talk about it for days. But if I can inspire you sufficiently to go away when you leave decompress and learn a little bit more about GraphQL, that would be an amazing outcome for me. So first of all, look, why was GraphQL born? And it's really a reflection of what's been happening in our industry. So microservices have become pervasive, cloud native, rich web interfaces. And all of these things combined has become a perfect storm to being able to deliver rich API experiences. We know no longer build just for websites. We have mobile apps. Your company might have an upcoming line of wearables. Each one of those clients can have very different data requirements. The data you can fit on a web page very different to a mobile, and again, very different to what you'll fit on your Apple Watch. So the question becomes then, how can we efficiently deliver the data to each one of these channel applications? And in fact, I'd posit, we could go a step better. What we should be looking to do is deliver exactly the data that each one of those client experiences requires in one round trip to the server. And that's, for me, one of the things, if you unpack the word compelling, it means that you improve all the non-functional aspects of it. It should be performant. It should be resilient. It should be simple. It should be intuitive. All of these that we can build into providing that compelling API experience. And this is really one of the, like, the main use cases which will position GraphQL today as this translation layer that will sit in front of all of your traditional interfaces. So it could be your modern HTTP microservices. It could be directly to a relational database, a graph database over TCP. And what we've got to do is we've got to retrieve exactly the data that your mobile app needs, that your wearable app needs, that your website needs in one round trip. Even more so, we're spoiled with websites, right? A user just clicks F5 and they've downloaded that new version. That's not the same with mobile apps where you actually have to push out a new version. We want to make sure that the data requirements of each version of that app is also optimized. So as we go through today, um, I've written a sample app that, uh, that seeks to address the main challenges that you will face when getting started with GraphQL. So no need to take the, a picture of this now. I'll put up a reference um, slide at the end. But the domain which we cover in this app, and one that we'll be going through with the demos today, is quite simple. It's, it's just about artists and albums. I get no points for originality, but it's a domain that we're all familiar with. So should be sort of like able to grok as we're going through. So effectively, we have artists. Artists compose albums. Those albums are released on labels. And then we also have the idea of users which could then submit reviews of these albums. And this is sort of the domain and the schema which we'll see as we go through the demos. So rather than talk a bit more about GraphQL, let's actually just see it in action. 
And so what I've just loaded up here is graphical. So you can think of graphical as being the IDE for GraphQL. It's not actually part of GraphQL itself, but if you download one of the servers, you will generally get this component with it. That's a React component. But what it lets you do is author queries and send them to the server. So we can write our first query in GraphQL. And we can just start with an opening and closing bracket. And in this particular case, we're going to say we're going to retrieve an artist. And we're just going to retrieve the artist with ID of one. And for this particular thing, we're just going to grab their name. And this particular case, nothing too fancy as yet. But you're already seeing some similarities. So we have a shape of a query on the left. And then in the data side on the right, again, we see artist and name. But so far, nothing you wouldn't see in a REST API. But again, we now say, OK, well, what happens if we wanted to retrieve each one of the albums for that particular artist? And again, we open closing brackets in GraphQL vocabulary that's called a selection set. And then each one of these items is here. It's called a field. And again, in a single query, we can now craft that we want to retrieve all of the albums that are retrieved on the right-hand side. So if you're thinking about how you might have done that in REST, you might have retrieved, like made one call to retrieve the artist, and then another call to retrieve each one of the albums. But again, nothing earth-shattering here. So we can go a little bit further. So we said then that each one of these albums is released on a label. So again, let's, let's include the label there. And then we get labels so we can see that the dummy album by Portishead was released on Gobi. We can even get a bit more interesting. What happens if we now want to say, retrieve all of the other albums that were, retrie that were produced on that particular label? And we can just keep on going. So again, retrieve all the albums, retrieve the, and then retrieve the artist for that, and again, retrieve the name. So what you can see now is we can arbitrarily build up these queries on the left-hand side, all in one round trip to the server. So you'll also notice as I've gone through, there's sort of like this type ahead thing. Like, that's, that's pretty cool. It seems like GraphQL knows what's a valid query or not. So some of the spare people in the room, or if you're using it in production, you're probably thinking there's some type system here. You're absolutely spot on. And then that's what actually defines the ability to produce these sort of type ahead queries. And there's actually a feature called introspection, which lets you query the schema itself. And that's exactly what Graphical is doing. Likewise, if I then typed in a field that doesn't exist, I get this nice error to say, this particular field doesn't exist on that type. So again, you could remove an entire category of problems that you might have with a weekly type system in REST, because you can mathematically prove that any query in GraphQL will either be able to be executed successfully on the server, or not if it doesn't match the domain-specific schema and the syntactic constraints defined by the GraphQL specification. So a lot more to dig in, but at least that should give you a feeling that what we've now done, instead of the server defining the various endpoints that the client can interact with, the client takes on control. We've inverted the responsibility where the client now defines exactly the data it needs which allows us to then satisfy that goal of each different version of each app or client experience to find the query that it needs. Some people in the room, again, probably thinking, I could absolutely have done that with REST. And you're right, you could have. But GraphQL makes it simple and trivial to do so. There's no more bike shedding about, this is how we do a sparse field set, or this is how we do server-side includes. It makes it cheap and trivial to do so. Again, absolutely, you could craft beautiful backends for front ends and optimize that. But is that actually delivering business value? Or is that just creating an architecture to get around the constraint of the solution that you've addressed? So again, we've now sort of find a way that we could do synchronous client interactions, irrespective of the client requirements, in one round trip. But what about real-time interactions? What about you know, chat push notifications? What about them? So, so far, we've been pulling data. Again, the client asks a question and waits for the response from the server. What if we could push data? Again, in the similar way that we inverted the responsibility from the client creating the query, how is it about the server could actually then push data to the client when a particular constraint or predicate resolves. 
So again, let's actually work through an example of when this might be valuable. So again, this user story, it says, as a user, I want to be notified when my favorite artist released albums so that I can keep up to date with the music that I love. Great, that sounds like a wonderful thing, that sort of value adds that we can add to a system. So again, if there's something new, we can then ask them to create a review maybe on our site. So again, we have a number of options that we could do for building a real-time API. Traditionally, we would have done polling. And to be honest, there is absolutely nothing wrong with polling, providing a couple of you know, things hold true. Polling's great when you know the refresh rate of your data. So if you're looking at financial exchange rates and you know they update once a day, that's fine. Just retrieve them once a day. You're falling down, though, if you have an intermittent refresh rate, because then you're trading off executing the query too many times versus having stale data. So again, that's that trade-off. Again, if we, push, if we adopt a push model, and there's two main schools of thought for how we can achieve that in GraphQL. The first is live queries. So you can effectively think of that as make a query, and then if any one of the fields change in that particular query, just push back that updated you know, set of data. Sounds really simple, but it, it effectively equates to infinitely fast polling on the server side. But it's very hard to implement you know, efficiently. And the other is subscriptions, which are event-based. So effectively, the idea from there is when a particular event or occurrence of something of interest to the business occurs, you can then notify the client. And a couple of properties of, of subscriptions, they're read-only, so you're not mutating or updating any data with that. The real secret source, though, of subscriptions is that they're expressed in the GraphQL syntax. So again, the client doesn't get served some arbitrary event structure. The client can actually express the query or data structure that they want to see when that event happens. And again, that's exactly the shape of the data that they will retrieve. So similar to the query, it's not just a standard event. You get to customize the set of data that you retrieve. And again, this is not something that we will use everywhere. Subscriptions are great when you have a large upfront data set, and then small incremental changes can be reflected on the UI. Or you have a requirement for real-time sort of like notifications to the client, a la, you know, like a chat interface, where timeliness is key. So how does this sort of work? So in a typical call architecture, we have down the left-hand side, that's the synchronous request response. So again, goes from the client, goes to GraphQL server, and returns up. So effectively, they're stateless interactions. What we're looking to do with subscriptions is they're inherently stateful. There is a long-lived connection between the client and the server. Of course there is. You have to push data to it. So if there's anything like signal law that you might have done like you know, 10 years ago, you know, it's a similar sort of idea whereby there will be a client makes a subscription in this, or makes, you know, sets their intent to, or interest in hearing about updates from the server. And then how does this actually then sort of like propagate back through? So down in your business domain, you will generally raise an event. So that can come from your business domain or it can come from, you know, it could be a Kafka topic or, you know, a RabbitMQ pub sub sort of domain. Ultimately, that event will get propagated up into the subscriptions framework of GraphQL. And effectively, that will be a stream of events. What the subscriptions um, stream mapper will then do is take that input stream and map it to an output stream. And that's the output stream for each one of those client queries. And then that gets sent back to the client. So clear? I think, it, I think a little example will, will help sort of clarify what that flow looks like. So, in the first case, the client will open up a WebSocket endpoint. In this particular case, I've called the endpoint subscriptions. It's not part of the spec, it's just what I chose. And in this particular case, they issue a subscription query to the server. In this particular case, they're saying, well, the, when the album added event happens, passing in their user ID, they want to get the title of the album and the name of the artist. So in this particular case, then another user comes in, in this case, an admin user adds a new album, 
what then happens is asynchronously, that album added event with the shape of the data that they requested gets pushed back to the user. So let's see that in action. So what we have here is a very, very, very simple 1D interface. This was meant to be something a bit richer, but I'll push a pull request over the next day or so to get it updated. So what we're now going to do is go back to graphical. And in this particular case, so what I just did there was setting up the client to you know, be interested in that particular subscription. So now I'm playing the role of the admin user who's now going to create that particular new album. And then all things going well, you will now see that that data in the same shape has been pushed back to the client. So again, just, I'm asking you to go on a journey with me and imagine that's a beautifully rendered web page now and you know, some notification pop up. So what have you seen? You have seen that GraphQL can solve not only synchronous request response architectures, but also service real-time push-based architectures. And the client only needs to understand GraphQL. It doesn't need to understand any other protocols. There's a common interface. So to wrap up, really hope you've enjoyed sort of like this initial sort of brief intro to GraphQL. If you have any questions or would like to chat afterwards, please do. I absolutely love talking about this stuff. I did see some hands up the back earlier who said they were using GraphQL, so please come and chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. That was great. Um, I've just started having a little bit of play with GraphQL, and it's, it's such a cool, lovely syntax. It's pretty human readable, which is great. And like, I love what you were saying before about making things just simple and like, easy and cheap. Like, Non-trivial is not not valuable or not powerful. Yeah, I can't agree more. I think a lot of, I think a lot of us treat problems, and I'm, and I'm guilty of it myself, for sort of achieving the approach with the technology that we've chosen is success, as yeah. opposed to the value of the product that you've delivered. So Yeah, yeah and making it not maintainable by other people is not valuable. Pretty much. Anyway, yeah. thanks all. Yep, thanks.